I was going to say, I think everything I've done in the past eight years has led to this video, but I think it might be everything I've done since I was 16. Hey folks, Matt Colville here, and this is the MCDM crowdfunding campaign. We are raising money for the new RPG we're working on, so this video might be long. We'll see. The video is broken into sections, what the game is, uh, what the crowdfunder is, and then a bunch of miscellaneous stuff at the end where we talk about MCDM and testing and whatnot. So if you want to skip around, feel free to use the chapters below, and we'll be doing live Q&As in various places. But I want to say right up front, the game is not done. If it were done, we wouldn't need to go to crowdfunding. So right up front, I'm going to pitch you on how this game works. I think for most people, if you know our reputation, there's definitely enough information in this video for you to make an informed decision about whether you want to back it right now. This is a brand new RPG made from scratch from the ground up. No sacred cows. It is explicitly heroic fantasy. If you are currently playing a heroic fantasy game, we think we can give you a better experience. We started work on this back in January, and we've only been full time on it for about three months but we already know a lot. The core design is already in playtesting, but there is a lot more to do. So I'm only gonna talk in this video about the stuff we don't think will change. But important caveat, we are not beholden to any shareholders, any brand, any legacy. If it's not fun, then we work on it until it is, which means some stuff I'm going to pitch you might change. I don't think it will, but it might. We start with the core design and we polish and iterate until it is solid and fun. And then we work outward toward the edge, adding more rules for more fiddly stuff. So if you have a question about the core, well, we, we probably know the answer to that. And hopefully the answer is in this video. If you're curious about the stuff sort of on the, the next ring out, we probably know how we want that design to work, but it hasn't been prototyped yet. And that's the kind of question we tend to answer in live streams. If your question's about some rule or feature way out here on the edge, we probably don't know. It's gonna take another, like 18 months to finish these two books, we think. So that's part of what this time buys, answers to those questions. But last thing before we get stuck in, we are crowdfunding these two books, Heroes, including character creation, customization, combat, the core rule book, basically, and Monsters, including rules for encounter building. That's about 800 pages, which is a lot, but we wanna make a game that does everything the game you're already playing does, but better, including a lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with fighting monsters. Well, the game you're already playing probably has several expansions and optional rules and settings and all that. We would love to do all that, but we can't do it all in 800 pages. So some stuff you might be looking forward to, we are also looking forward to, it just might not be in those core 800 pages. If the game does well, if the audience for it grows over time, well, we would love nothing more than to make a ton of cool stuff for you. But that is the future. This is the MCDM RPG. No, we do not know the name yet. We have a short list we like, but we're still thinking about it. And right now we don't think the name is the most important. All it would mean is when people talked about the game, other people would say, what's that? And then you'd have to say, oh, it's the MCDM RPG. So for right now, we are saving you a step. We have these keywords that go a long way toward describing the goals of this game at a high level. So if you want that, I encourage you to head over to the backer kit page, a link below and check out the preview pages. It's like, Imagine the book were done and you open it to some random pages. Well, we mocked those up for you. Nothing in there is final, but it does show the direction we're going. One of those spreads covers the tactical, heroic, cinematic, fantasy keywords. But right now, I'm gonna tell you how the game works. It's a 2D6 game. On your turn, you can move and attack. And yes, you can move some, attack, and then finish moving. When you attack, you roll 2D6, add a modifier for one of your stats, and that is your damage. Your damage roll is your attack roll. You cannot miss. Every round, you are making progress. But so are the bad guys. And the only questions are, did you make a lot of progress this round or little? Are you making more progress than the bad guys or less? Is your teamwork better? Are your tactics better? Lots of abilities have effects like poisoned or on fire or knockback. If an attack has an effect, then your target makes a resistance roll, which is 2d6 plus a stat versus a target number. Anytime you see TN anywhere, it means target number. And that is because I started as a designer in the 90s and everybody used target number back then. And I just think it's a clearer name for what it's doing. I mentioned knockback. A lot of abilities have knockback. A lot of characters have knockback resistance. Combat in this game is way more dynamic than the game you're probably used to. It's a lot more like a, an action movie. 
People get thrown around a lot, mostly by being hit with big heavy weapons. People get thrown into things like walls or doors that might break. People get thrown into other people, in which case both of them are going to take some damage. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and it usually hurts. This is fun. It's already working. The testers loved it. The talent PC loved throwing goblins through walls with their brain. It is a class-based game. Every class comes with a heroic resource they get to manage. Each heroic resource works differently. If you played the Beast Heart or the Talent or the Illrigger, you already know how this works. The Beast Heart manages ferocity. The Talent manages strain. Each class has a couple of signature actions. Remember retainers from every product I think we've made? Same idea. You have a couple of cool things you can do every round. They do not run out. None of them are just, I swing my sword. They all do something cool. But as the battle goes on, you get more and more of your heroic resource. Like right now, the shadow gets insight anytime they see somebody crit, right? Each crit represents the shadow learning more about their opponents. Crits happen a little more often in our game, FYI. Then each class has a couple of abilities that they spend their resource on. Like the tactician currently has an ability called forward that grants all allies a free move. Very cool. The goal here is twofold. One, it is more fun to have your own cool little resource to manage. It makes you feel more like you are in charge of your character rather than the rules. You choose to hoard or spend your heroic resource. But it also means the battle gets more interesting the longer it goes on, not less. It means it should not turn into a slog where we've all burned through all of our spell slots or whatever, and now we're just slogging it out. In fact, let's talk about the classes in the game. These are not all of the classes, just some, and we do not know how many classes can we fit in those 800 pages I was talking about. So some of our cool ideas might have to wait for a supplement. We'll see. The core rules will have at least six classes because we think that's the minimum you need to play a lot of different characters with plenty of customization options. Hopefully it will have more. I would love nothing more than to just sit here talking about how all of our classes work, but the reality is that would be a four hour long video and I need to sleep sometime. I did a whole video already about the tactician and the shadow. If you wanna know more about how those classes currently work, go watch those videos. Link uh, up here and probably down in the doobly-doo. But let's do a quick tour. The tactician is our melee warrior, the master of the battlefield, the professional. They grant their allies extra attacks, extra maneuvers, more movement. It's sort of subtle, but when there's a fury or a shadow in the party, you think, oh, those goblins are gonna die. But when there's a tactician in the party, you think, oh, we're gonna win. The shadow is our stealthy assassin class. They are a high damage, high mobility, low health class, the glass cannon. But they have lots of tools and tricks to avoid damage. Now, I'm going to stop for a second and explain how initiative works. There are rules for determining which side goes first, the heroes or the monsters. If the heroes go first, the players decide which hero takes their turn. When that player is done, a monster takes their turn. Or, you know, maybe like a squad of monsters. It depends on how buff the monsters are. Then, when those monsters are done, the players decide, from among those players who haven't acted yet, who goes next. Once everyone's gone, you move to the next round, and you do it all again. That's it. There is no die roll you make at the beginning that locks in a random but specific order. You choose. Okay, Anna already went. Who wants to go now? We do it this way, and, and obviously this could change. We do it this way because we want to promote teamwork. <laughs> Actually coordinate with each other. Talk about what you want to do and why. Come up with a plan. But like all plans, the enemy gets a vote. We've been running it this way all year. And it works. It, it does what we want. People do talk about what they want to do. They come up with combos. It encourages players to pay attention to what the other characters at the table can do. It is very cool when other players start relying on your dope stuff. And since every turn means a player is making progress, it's not... You'd be surprised how often it's like, I, I could go now, but I don't have to. My cool thing is going to be cool no matter when I do it. But then sometimes it's like, no, 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 I want to act now. When that happens, it is usually obvious to everyone why that is a good idea. I bring this up now because the Shadow is currently the only class that breaks this rule. They have an ability called Hesitation is Weakness that lets them spend insight to take their turn immediately after another hero goes, and that is very powerful and fun. The Shadow was our first home run class where everybody who played the very first prototype loved it 
And that was very useful to us because it meant we had a benchmark, something to shoot for, make all of these as fun as this. Well, speaking of fun as, the Fury is our shirtless, himbo, big axe warrior class, like a barbarian or a berserker, but we think Fury is a cooler name. Now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, obviously, about how each class resource works and everything you can do with every class resource, because then this video would go on forever, but let's talk for a minute about the Fury's class resource. The Fury's heroic resource is called Rage. It's not, the, uh, it's not the most original name for this, we realize, but it really is the best term for what it describes. The point is, other classes spend their heroic resource to do stuff, and the Fury can do that too. But as you accumulate more rage, you gain buffs, like damage reduction, or a bonus to damage, or movement. Eventually, save up enough rage, and you can keep fighting even when you're at negative health. So playing a Fury is like driving this crazy hot rod, pedal to the metal, always on the cusp of turning into a flaming wreck, wondering, how far can I push this? How close can I get to the red line? Every time I play a Fury, well, I die, uh, frankly, because I keep thinking, sure, I'm about to aggro an entire second encounter in the middle of this one, but that just means more rage, and that means I'll be invincible. <laughs> Spoilers, uh, I was not invincible. Three melee heroes, let's talk about some casters. Right now, I am working on well, right now, I'm working on this video, but once I'm done, I go back to prototyping the Elementalist. That's your fireball, lightning bolt class, a lot more focused than a D20 wizard. However, it's still in early prototype stages, so the patrons will hear about that soon enough. For now, our main caster is the Talent. Yeah, we already had this design, so we just ported it over to our game. The Talent is our psionic caster, and it works like this. Go watch that video if you wanna learn more. You can basically already play this class in your 5e game. The talent manages strain, and it is a negative resource. It debuffs you, but those debuffs don't affect your ability to manifest your powers. It affects everything else, but you can keep casting. Our priest cleric class is the conduit. It's funny, uh, James named it and I thought, oh, I like that. I instantly knew it was our priest class as soon as I saw the name. Conduits have two resources, wrath and virtue. And you can probably already guess what they do. Wrath powers your offensive prayers, and Virtue powers your defensive prayers. You have some control over which you get, but you also sometimes roll on the prayer table. The gods can be unpredictable. This design is a James Introcaso original, and I love it. I could instantly see how each god or saint could get their own prayer table. Very cool. We have prototypes for other classes that we've tested, but the past three months have been hyper-focused on the core gameplay loop, and for that purpose, we concentrated on the Shadow, the Fury, the Tactician, the Conduit, and the Talent. Those, plus the Elementalist, will probably be core. What other classes might be in here? We don't know. Uh, we won't know for a while because that's down to the tyranny of the page count. Some of the classes I'm about to talk about might be in the Hero's Book. If not, you know, assuming people like the game, well, all we want to do is make more cool stuff for you, so we hope we get to bring all these classes to you. For instance, I would be really surprised if the Beast Heart isn't in the Heroes book. We already made that class once. It was one of the first classes we prototyped for this game. Got a whole video you can watch if you want to see how it works. And since Paladins are the best class in every game, I really hope the Sensor is core. If you've played an Illrigger, uh, especially the Illrigger Revised, you sort of already know the Sensor. The censor is our holy warrior. They place judgments on their enemy. They literally censor them, which lets them do really nasty things to that enemy. Same as seals with the Illrigger. The censor will have its own subclasses. We like subclasses. We like having lots of ways to clearly differentiate two characters of the same class. And some of those subclasses may be Illrigger subclasses, like the Shadow Master. But the Illrigger has like five cool subclasses now, so it may be the Sensor is one class, and later we release the Illrigger for this game, and it's like the Paladin anti Paladin thing. Uh, also, we prototype the Troubadour, our swashbuckling theatrical hero. The Troubadour's heroic resource is drama. I just realized we need to give this class a tension and resolution ability. I think we only tried the Troubadour in one playtest. It worked really well, as I recall, but we had to stop making cool new classes and focus on the core experience, so we haven't touched it in a while. We also very strongly believe in a class we have not yet prototyped, the Summoner. The Summoner is our Necromancer class. We think there will be other Summoner subclasses that summon other things, like fairies or little elementals, but the Necromancer is the fantasy driving this design, and even though we haven't prototyped it yet, we believe in it very strongly. 
There has never been, to my certain knowledge, a TTRPG that really delivers on the necromancer fantasy, and it, we may discover that there are good reasons for that. But we have the minion design from Flea Mortals, hugely popular. We think minions are the solution to the necromancer problem. It's that simple. We think the summoner summons a bunch of little squishies that individually are no big deal, but once you've got four or five of them surrounding you, you're in trouble. And we think the summoner can sacrifice their minions to power up cool spells. So it may be the summoner's heroic resource is minions. Our unarmed martial artist is the Null. You sort of met a Null in the talent fiction, but you didn't get to see what they can do. The Null is so called because while the talent studies perfection of mind, the Null studies perfection of body. They are explicitly anti-magic. We have no prototype for this yet, but we are champing at the bit to get to it. High-level nulls probably project an anti-magic field around them uh, without ideally interfering with their teammates' cool magic stuff. I said high-level. This is a good place to mention that we think max level is 10th level. You should level up once per adventure, where an adventure is like 32 to 64 pages. We think if you play this game every week for like uh, a year and a half, give or take, you should hit max level. That's 78 sessions over 300 hours. That's a lot. But... It's doable. We want people to get to max level. We don't want to waste our time designing class levels no one's ever going to see. We don't want to sell you on the fantasy of playing a high-level hero. We want you to actually get to play a high-level hero. That also means our game is easier to design, easier to balance, more fun to play, no dead levels. We think 10th-level heroes are basically demigods, like Hercules when he's hanging out with Jason and the Argonauts. But... And this is important, at first level, you are already a hero in our game. In fact, you may be famous. Only locally famous, probably, but yeah. This is not the story of how you were a peasant who just picked up a sword this morning. So a first level hero in our game is like a third level hero in D20 Fantasy. Our max power level is probably about the same as theirs. It's just we're compressing it all down so that you can actually get there. Anyway, this video is already super long for a crowdfunding video, and we haven't even gotten to the crowdfunding part. There's just too much stuff to talk about in one video. If this stuff sounds cool to you, I think you will like this game. Remember, we're the folks who made Flea Mortals. We made Strongholds and Followers, Kingdoms and Warfare, The Talent, The Beast Heart, The Ill Rigger. We put out Arcadia every month for like two years. People loved it. Have you seen Where Evil Lives? It's an entire book full of ready-made scenarios, boss fights. Each one you can play in one evening, just a couple of encounters. But it's epic, and I think it shows you how we think. I think each product we've made is better than the last, and the work speaks for itself. If this is the first time you've heard of MCDM, go read some reviews. They're pretty good. But before we move on to the crowdfunding details, I want to talk about victories and recoveries. We like the idea that each battle gets cooler as the players are gaining more of their heroic resource. Well, we also like that idea for adventures. So one core part of the rules already working, super important to the feel of the game, is victories. Every time you beat an encounter, and this includes things like negotiations, you gain a victory. And every character has a couple of modifiers they can use once per encounter based on how many victories they have. So, like, the Fury has these two buffs they can give themselves called Victorious Anger, where you can either do more damage or gain more movement based on how many victories you've earned. Each class has these, and since, as long as you keep pushing forward, you keep earning victories, that means your hero is getting more epic the longer they press on. Right? It's that same experience in the encounter, where you get more and more of your resource, except at the adventure level. Then, when you rest, and resting in our game is more like going back to Rivendell, it's not just spending the night. When you rest, a couple of things happen. First, your victories all convert into experience, and that's how we manage leveling up. Now, this means your victories go back to zero. Yeah, you can't just keep accumulating victories until you become an invulnerable orc fury. But resting also gets you all your recoveries back. Each class has a certain number of recoveries, and they are how you heal yourself. Anyone can spend an action to take a recovery, but only once per encounter. Basically just whew, taking a breather. Healers and leaders, like the tactician, the conduit, the sensor, can use their actions, or sometimes a maneuver, to let you spend your recoveries and get some healing in combat. Jason played an early prototype of the sensor, and he really liked the fact that he could fight, tank a little, and heal his allies. So, over the course of the adventure, you're getting more victories, but you're spending recoveries, which creates this fantastic tension between pressing on and stopping. 
which we saw work the very first time we tested this. James was running an encounter. We fought some goblins who were working for an ogre. Well, it turned out the ogre was an agent of the Time Raiders. And after we beat the ogre, which uh, was not easy, we found a device which would take us to the bridge of the Time Raiders ship. Now, this is more space fantasy than you normally get in Vasloria, but it's just a playtest. So suddenly, we have to have a real talk, because my talent, Lynn, was full of victories. But Lars's shadow was real low on recoveries, so we had to talk. What's on the other side of this portal? Uh, diplomacy or combat? If it's combat, do we want to appear in front of a bunch of four-armed, crystal-eyed time warriors with full health or full of victory? So this is how we balance and fine-tune the encounter versus the adventuring day. I think this design gives us all the tools we need to get there and make it fun. Okay, I, I, said, I said no more rules talk, but we got to talk about one more thing. Negotiation. If you know me, you know character, motivation, role-playing, diplomacy are big parts of every fantasy game I run and the fiction I write. It's why our first products were all about politics. Well, this is important. We don't want to make the things you're already doing more complex. I want to give people more cool stuff to do. So in our game, if you want to convince the librarian of the Imperial College to let you look at a specific book, that's just normal role-playing with maybe a, a die roll thrown in. But if you want to convince someone to throw in with you, or maybe you know, convince an enemy's ally to sit a battle out, that's a negotiation. Negotiation is straightforward. Most NPCs, you don't worry about this. But maybe once per adventure, there's someone important enough to negotiate with, and they would have these two stats. Patience and interest. You want their interest to go up, and they must have some interest, otherwise, why are they talking to you? So interest goes to zero, negotiation over, probably time to draw steel. But every round or whatever, their patience can go down. So you're never just going in circles. No one's patience is infinite. Then it's just a case of, can you convince them to help you? And that requires imagining them complexly. Any NPC you can negotiate with, and we want to throw in lots of examples and sample NPCs so directors don't need to do a lot of work if they don't want to, any NPC you can negotiate with has pitfalls, things you should not bring up, otherwise you're just going to piss them off, and motivations. Learn their motivations, avoid the pitfalls, and suddenly, maybe you can get that lich in the pale keep to help you out. Sure, he's evil, but that doesn't mean he can't be reasoned with. Maybe go do a little digging, some investigation to see what motivates them, what their pitfalls are. Maybe you can convince Romeo's parents to allow the marriage. You'd be astonished at the kinds of stories and drama this opens up. Now, some people see this and they freak out because it feels like a lot, but it's just giving the concept of diplomacy, which is complicated, what we think of as simple rules. Interest versus patience. Avoid the pitfalls. I don't think this is complicated. It's more like a framework. And I believe once players see that negotiation is possible, many players will enjoy the idea that they can change the conditions of the test themselves, really affect the world politically. There's a great negotiation in the Regent of Bedegar, the adventure and strongholds and followers, but there are no rules for it. So people liked it, but they couldn't see how to do that in some other scenario. It was too specific to the adventure. These rules open that idea up so that any director or player can do it. It broadens the kinds of stories you can tell and encourages players to think about talking, role-playing, instead of only combat. Right? We're not trying to take something you're already doing, normal role-playing, and make it more complicated. Nope, most interactions are just still some role-playing and a die roll. But with negotiation, your character can change the world in heroic ways without resorting to violence. I mean, fighting orc chieftains is fun, but talking to them is a nice change of pace. That's the game, folks. I mean, that's not the game. We've barely scratched the surface. Go check out the preview pages. Read the dwarf entry. I think you'll like it. Yes, lots of questions. We will probably do a frequently asked questions video here next week once we have a better idea what questions are more frequently asked. But let's talk about how this crowdfunder is going to work. We're funding two books this time, so we're asking for more than we ever have before but still less than the first three Kickstarters did. So we're optimistic. We will not be surprised if we don't fund. We are all well-educated on the challenges in this space. But we believe in what we're doing. The campaign is going to run for about 30 days, which gives people a, a couple of paycheck cycles and maybe some post-holiday money to spend. But we know it's the end of the year and what that's like. 
Like all our crowdfunding campaigns, assuming we fund, you'll be able to get in later, pre-order later, next year or whatever. Missing out on some cool limited edition thing does not mean you're missing out on the game. So what are we crowdfunding? What are those two books? Heroes, which is rules for making heroes and all the rules for combat, skills, negotiation, all that. Rules for all the things heroes do, including advancement and rewards. We think it's important that like you know, magic items are in the player's book so players can see what rewards are out there and develop ambition. Ooh, the sword of six elements. Can I, can I get that? Well, there's a rumor. It might be in the temple of perpetual weirdness. Right now, players get motivated to do stuff. It's still up to the director to award magic items, but we think the players should know what rewards are out there. The second book is Monsters. No clever name does what it says on the tin. Heroes and Monsters. The Monsters book is basically flea mortals with all the stuff we had to cut, plus some new stuff tossed in. No environments, no enemy parties, so we have room for more monsters. And rules for balancing encounters, like the ones in Flea Mortals, which, spoilers, people really like. Now you may be thinking, oh, what about this book or that book? Well, two things. First, we don't think we need a, a director's guide, so to speak. If you want to learn how to run the game, I got some videos for you. Almost none of them are specific to any edition of any RPG. But stuff like optional rules, advice, we would rather do that in something like Arcadia, assuming all goes well. Bring back the periodical PDF where we can try new stuff. And the magic items are in the Heroes book, so I don't think we need a director's guide. I think something like an Encounter Builder's Guidebook might be useful, but it would mostly be a book full of examples. You know, more NPCs with all the negotiation stuff built in. Scenarios like the ones in Where Evil Lives. Just a ton of content, not just advice, ready to drop into your game. But that's not core. That would be a supplement. And that's the future, and none of us know the future. So the answer to the question, oh, are you guys going to make a book about... We don't know. We would love to. We would love to make lots of adventures for this game. We want to promote the stuff you make for it. But that depends on whether people want this game. So, two books. The Heroes book is 40 bucks in PDF. The Monster book, you cannot get on its own. Well, not right now, at least. I just, we couldn't figure out why someone would want to buy just a Monster book without the rules. If that's your style, just go buy Flea Mortals. So the Heroes book for 40 bucks, both books in PDF for... Just for this crowdfunder, 65 bucks. We think that's a good deal. The price will go up after the crowdfunder, but you'll still get a discount if you buy them together. Now, that might sound like a lot to you. We get it. But I promise you this. However much money we raise, you will see where the money went. Don't believe me? Go check out everything we've ever done. Lots of people prefer the books in hardcover. The Heroes book is 70 bucks in hardcover. That's almost 400 pages, remember. Does 70 bucks sound like a lot? Well, we get it, but keep watching. There's a whole chunk at the end of the video that explains why our prices are what they are. Uh, spoilers, it's because we want the people who work for us to earn a decent living. Both books in hardcover, $135, a little less than twice the cost of one book. It's just the cost of logistics and printing these things at this level of quality is enormous. It is by far the biggest risk we take every time we do this. Discounting the hardcovers is death for a company like ours. But remember, it's the same rules. You could just buy the PDF. Now, there is a limited edition. We like limited editions. I like them as a customer. I am really looking forward to my Homeworld 3 limited edition. The limited editions are, they're the same books, but they have a natty black cover with a cool symbol or logo embossed on them in gold foil. They each have a dust jacket, so every crowdfunder, some folks order the limited edition. It shows up, and they're like, hey, where's the cool black cover? And we say, take the shrink wrap off, and then they do, and they discover that this is just a dust jacket, and they go, oh, uh, never mind. If you order the limited edition, it will come in a cool slipcase that holds both books. I love that. It's one of the perks of funding two books at once. Now, for the first time, in addition to the limited editions, we have the Ajax edition. This is explicitly for folks who, you know, you're doing okay, you're not saving for a house, you don't have kids. Uh, people like me, basically. The Ajax edition is expensive, but it has the same rules in it and literally the same limited edition hardcovers. It's not a different edition of the book from the limited edition. It just comes with a lot of cool stuff, like a cloth map of Vasloria. This is the default setting in these rules, same as Dusk or the Chain of Acheron. We partnered with Kyle Latino, aka Mapcrow, a fellow D&D tuber who's been in the community a, a long time and is in our playtests. We reached out to Kyle, actually, 
everybody we've reached out to to ask if they want to help has said yes. It's a huge vote of confidence. This cloth map will be about this big, relatively low detail. It's not a poster map. It's more like the classic maps you got in the old Ultima games or the old Blizzard games. It's more just a, a fun piece of art and a neat prop. But it'll tell you a lot about the world. There'll be a director's screen with all sorts of useful and fun stuff on it. You ready for this? There's an exclusive Ajax Mini, in case you're wondering why it's called the Ajax edition. Now, this is just uh, the 2D uh, line art for it. It'll turn into a 3D sculpt and then a miniature. Ajax the Invincible, the Iron Saint, is one of the campaign end bosses in our world. And now you'll be able to fight him with stats from our game and a dope-ass mini. Probably a mini kit, which means you got to assemble it and paint it, but that's part of the fun. If you want to learn more about Ajax, go check out the first episode of The Chain of Akron. But he looks like this. I mean, you know, he's a man of the people. I mean, not these people, obviously. These people are all going to die. There's an exclusive coin. We find coins are a good way for folks to show and keep track of who has already taken their turn. Visually, very easy to do. And you get a custom set of dice, appropriate to our game, which means a couple of D6s, some D4s for boons and banes, and then one or more D8s for the impact dice. If we do a good job, you won't even need to know which one is the D8. It'll be the red one. <laughs> We're working with Cook and Becker, who you may not know, but they've made tons of limited editions for other games, and it's just insane we get to work with them on this. Here is a little preview image the folks at Cook and Becker mocked up for us. Oh my god, look at it. It's gorgeous. I want it. This is the first time we've done something like this. I always wanted to do something more than just a, a special hardcover, and this is that. I, got, I can't get too excited. It is not real yet. But if we fund, you may see me get emotional once this is real and in our hands. And yours. We always like doing a new t-shirt whenever we do these crowdfunders, and this is no different. Except, this time, the shirt has official fan art of our classes. This is amazing. One of our patrons, Guillaume, read an early Patreon post where we talked about the different character classes, and they did this dope fan art for all of them, which was adorable, and everyone instantly loved it. So, when the time came to figure out what goes on the new RPG shirt, I said... Hey, what about Guillaume's art? So we reached out, said, we want to pay you for that fan art, pay you to make it look good on a t-shirt. And they said, yes. I love the fact that people are already making fan art for this game. People are engaged. They can see it in their minds and they want to make stuff for it. That's what we're crowdfunding, folks. It's a lot, but we believe in this. We think there will be, uh, assuming we fund, some free downloadable quick start rules but we won't even start working on that until the actual rules are done. We think we can get this product to you by the second quarter of 2025. And if that seems like a long way away, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we're going to do this. Our goal is to get this product to you in the second quarter, probably late in the second quarter, like June of 2025. But we don't think our backers, but hopefully that's you, will have to wait that long. We think by the time the finished PDF comes out, you will have already been playing this game for a while. Right now, we are still in very early testing. We have prototypes of level one heroes and monsters, and that's it. No character customization yet, no second level yet. Game is already fun, but there is a lot of work to do. Here's how testing works. We test everything internally, we run a play test twice a week, and me and James are often running the game for people outside of MCDM. Once we feel good about whatever we're testing, we send it to our contract testers. These are people we pay to run tests for us. I do not know how many other TTRPG companies have paid testers, but we do. It's important to us. The contract testers self-assemble and run their own games, and there's a pool of volunteer testers they rely on. These are sourced from the community, so if you head to our Discord, there's already a channel where those folks are free to talk about their experience. We take the testers' feedback, revise, and then go back to testing. And we keep doing this until we feel like things are basically working. There are often known problems at this stage, but we feel good about where it's headed. At this point, whatever we're testing goes to our patrons. We have a Patreon, and it's for the people who want to watch the sausage being made. Backer kit is for people who want the game. We hope that's you. The Patreon is for people who want to watch development, warts and all. That's something we learned from previous Kickstarters. When we post dev diaries on Kickstarter, after like the first like one or two, the comments all turn into, hey, when's this book going to be done? and people start getting real spicy. So, with Flea Mortals, we switched things up. We waited, you know, radio silence, until a batch of monsters was basically done, and we gave them to the backers in what we called packets. They loved that. No dev diary on Flea Mortals, just silence, until there was something polished to play. That's how this is gonna work. Huge improvement on the old way. So, patrons, 
get to see all the stuff we threw out. Backers get the polished product, but thanks to the Patreon, we have a pretty big group of beta testers. So patrons become the beta testers and that adds another cycle to testing. We think we'll have something very primitive, but working to send to the patrons this month. You might think, oh, if I join the Patreon, I get the game early. <laughs> Please do not do that. <laughs> the patrons are about to see the worst version of the game there will ever be from here on out. The least playable version, the most annoying version there's gonna be. But these are the folks interested in learning about game design. They are our guinea pigs and they have signed up to be experimented on. I recommend backers, wait for the polished backer packet. It will be a much better experience for you. Because eventually, we don't know when, eventually the backers, you, will get the first backer packet, which will be small, but polished and playable. Probably the Delian Tomb, maybe the Delian Tomb Plus Plus, we'll see. That's what I mean when I say, we don't think you're gonna have to wait until the PDFs are done to play this game. But this process is a lot of work on top of actually designing the game. So the better this crowdfunder does, the more likely we can make this happen faster, pay people to help us make it faster. So yeah, there will be a release in 2025, presuming we fun. But I think by that time, the finished PDF will be like a souvenir. People will already be playing the game and making content for it. And we think that's just a more healthy way. Slow growth. This is what we did with Flea Mortals and it worked great. Okay, so you know what the game is about. I pitched you on the core design. You know about the pledge levels and what all is in them. You know our delivery date and you know how we do testing and you know you should get the first backer packet sometime next year. Let's talk about stretch goals. I really hope you stuck around with this video so far. If we hit a million dollars, uh, we will be very happy <laughs> because that means we funded and then some. If we hit 1.5 million, which sounds like a stupid amount of money, and it is, but it's less than our first three Kickstarters did. If we hit 1.5 million, we will pay someone to work on a VTT for us. I hope people are freaking out right now to an appropriate level because this has been a dream of mine for years. Now, I am not saying at 1.5 million, you are going to get a VTT. We don't have control over that. Software development is incredibly risky and complicated. All we're saying is we will pay someone to start making one explicitly for our game. Unlike the books, we do not feel comfortable promising a VTT will exist, just that we are going to spend the money on one. But it's already working. Here's a screen grab. Here's another one. We already found someone, actually, they found us, they built a working prototype, and after they demoed it for us, we gave them our rules, and three days later, we got a new demo, and it was 2D6, and they had already implemented the shadow. It was amazing. I am very bullish on a virtual tabletop because I am old and I have a lot of friends that don't live anywhere around here. I want to play with them. And I just don't feel like other companies, other VTTs are in a position to give our customers the best experience because other VTTs have to be a generic solution you can use for any game. Well, we think a purpose-built tool, don't, a purpose-built tool would provide a much better experience. You'll still be able to get VTT support for your favorite VTT. We just think the experience on our VTT will be better. You know, my friend Jordy wanted to run a popular sci-fi RPG for all of us, and the game seemed cool. But since we're all in different parts of the country, we used a VTT, and it's a popular VTT. But the implementation of that RPG's rules was community sourced, I think, and it was really janky. We want to give our customers the best experience possible, and we think that means we need to insource development of our own VTT. Now, if you already see your friends every week in person, I'm not sure what value the VTT would have for you. You might be able to use the software to manage your character, maybe even manage combat while you move minis around on the actual table. We did that for years with fourth edition and it was awesome. But if you do use a VTT or you would given the chance, here's the thing. Since we're insourcing this, it means you won't have to buy your books twice. The content you buy on the store will be in the VTT. Now, we don't have a lot of details on this yet. There may be reasons we can't make this work, but right now, we don't know what those reasons are. We think there will be a monthly fee and we think our patrons paying eight bucks a month will automatically get the VTT. We have lofty ambitions when it comes to this. We want people to be able to make their own content for this thing, sell the content they make. That would be amazing. But we all come from video games and we know software development is hard and we don't know the future. 
I have had the experience of busting my ass to make a third party VTT do what I want. And when it's working, it's amazing. It, it speeds up the game. I mean, I think our design already speeds up the game quite a bit, but a good VTT can automate a lot of stuff, like the math of damage. It doesn't validate anything. It doesn't play the game for you. You know, if you have eight movement and you move your little character 12, it won't stop you. But it is very nice to have a machine just handle all the annoying bookkeeping. Okay, a VTT at 1.5 million, or at least we pay someone to work on it. We are already working on it and we hope something comes of it. That's the first stretch goal. Second, well, this game has a default setting. Same setting as the Chain of Acheron or Dusk, which you can watch here. But the setting is not the point of these core books. We assume you have your own world or somebody else's world you love, and we are making this game to work with any sufficiently archetypal fantasy world. But we think fantasy means different things to different people, and we want everyone to find their fantasy in our game. So we have three different settings, all part of the same universe. No idea if they will all get their own products. That's, that's sort of up to you. Vasloria is our medieval European fantasy analog. It's a region with several nations in our world, one of about seven regions. You've seen a tiny part of the map of Vasloria in the Kingdoms and Warfare book. It is an archetypal fantasy setting, just done the MCDM way. Then we have Capital, the greatest city in this or any age, the city of the great game, which you've watched if you've seen the Chain of Akron. Capital is our high fantasy urban intrigue setting. And we've actually got like, I don't know, like 60,000 words written for a potential capital supplement. Okay, so Vasloria, classic fantasy, capital, urban fantasy, both in the same world of Orden, but you can leave Orden and travel to other worlds. That collection of worlds is called the Timescape. That's an anagram of space-time. Basically, what would a fantasy Einstein call this multiverse? The Timescape is explicitly space fantasy, much more 70s retro future like John Berkey or Chris Foss or like Guardians of the Galaxy. Not science fiction, not like The Expanse, not remotely plausible, but more laser swords and talking animals. You know, gravity and sound in space, that kind of setting. Well, just the idea of three different settings, I mean, technically they're, they're one big setting, all part of the same cosmos, but supporting three different settings, that seems pretty unlikely to me. That would require this game being really successful over the course of many years. But we can get started on one setting. So if we hit $2 million, which again is a stupid amount of money, but we've made 2 million before, at 2 million, we find somebody we pay to be the line developer for a Vasloria box set. They're gonna work with freelancers and illustrators and a cartographer to make a dope box set with maps and handouts and you know, like a calendar and holidays, points of interest, factions, NPCs, everything you need. Again, that doesn't mean you're gonna get this, just we will hire somebody to work on it. If it actually gets done, we'll probably do another printing so folks can buy it and they'll get it you know, a few months later, like we did with Where Evil Lives. We imagine this box will be full of booklets, staple bound 128 pages or so. And the goal is to give you a high level overview of the region, along with a more detailed guide to one specific local area. And then we would like to include a few small adventures, 32 to 64 pages to give you that classic sandbox feel. Every adventure has a bad guy and it's probably impossible to stop them all before one of them completes their evil plan. And that's how you know who the end boss is. I will certainly be closely involved with this, but someone else will have to get it across the finish line, and that is the person we'll start looking for if we hit $2 million. Like the VTT, we're not saying this will exist. Uh, that's way too far in the future to guarantee that. We have seen other folks run campaigns like this where they promise an entire line of products, and two years later, the money has run out, and where's the rest? Well, we don't want to do that. We want slow, steady growth. So $2 million? We pay someone. That's all we can promise. Uh, these are our only stretch goals. It's enough, but there's still lots to talk about. We plan on releasing a license for this. Actually, it's probably one of the first things we'll start on if we fund. This game is only gonna become a going concern if people can make their own stuff for it, make and share and yeah, publish, make money off it. We would love that. That means we need a license. We like the Shadow Dark license. It'll probably be something like that. You'll be able to use our rules and our setting. We already have tons of creative partners we love working with, and we want to empower them and you to do whatever you want with this stuff. How much is shipping going to be? 
Well, we don't know. We don't know the future and we're not in charge of how much shipping costs. It's up to other companies like DHL or UPS or whatever, and the logistics companies that pack boxes and get the books from the printer to the shipping company. That's the handling part of shipping and handling. So we wait as long as possible to charge folks for shipping because we don't want to charge you on one day. And the next day, the price of oil shoots up and suddenly we didn't charge you enough and we go bankrupt trying to cover the difference. That really happens. We can tell you this. It's going to be expensive. Shipping is expensive now. And the more books you order, the more expensive it gets. And if you live outside the U.S., it's going to be stupid expensive. We can't do anything about that. But we can give you fair warning. Now, you may be looking at the PDFs and the hardcovers thinking, I ain't got that kind of cash right now. We sympathize, but this is not a store. This is not like pre-ordering a video game. This is the crowdfunder. The crowdfunder pays for development. If you don't feel like supporting development, if you just want the finished product, maybe wait. Assuming we fund, you can pick it up later. But the more people who believe now, the better a product we can make. Most of the money we're raising, it's going to go to the art. We have a really high bar of quality for art. I think we have the best art in the business, but that costs money. And I want to add, good art is part of a good presentation, and presentation is part of design. It's one thing to describe something using words, but then when you see it, now it's real. Every time we do this, we get people who see the PDF and then the hardcover and the PDF, and they ask, can I get the hardcover cheaper without the PDF? No, that is the price of the hardcover. And if you buy it, we just give you the PDF for free. Getting close to the end, folks. Stick with it. Almost done. What are the risks here? Well, it's time, mostly, and expectations. I said things in this video like, we expect you'll get the first backer packet in you know June, maybe. But here's the thing. Getting packets together means designing content for that packet, on top of the core design work we're already doing. Testing that content, editing it, collating it all, and delivering it to you, the backers. Then collecting your feedback, collating that, so the dev team can figure out what to do about it. And that is basically a full-time job for at least a couple of weeks. That's time. Time I don't know if we'll have. If we only barely fund, we might not have time to release backer packets. Or, or maybe just one. So that's a risk. We are a very tiny company, and we are about to take on an enormous project. We are not going to have a lot of free cycles for anything but development. Unless this crowdfunder does well. If it does, we can pay people to help us, which we like doing. We can, to a certain extent, Mythical Man Month, buy time with money by hiring people and using their time. So we can't promise backer packets. We can't promise the game will be done in 18 months. It's just, this is what we think right now. The better we do, the more likely those things become. But this isn't an exact science. I think we've made incredibly good progress considering we've only been full-time on this for like three months. But the future is uncertain. I mentioned expectations. We are not making the perfect game. There is no such thing. Even games I love and spend hundreds or even thousands of hours on, there are things in there I think are bad design. And when I stream these games, I bitch about it. But then I have to explain, I'm just venting. Any sufficiently complicated game, it's just impossible to hit a home run with every piece of design. It can't be done. Because any sufficiently complicated game has all of these interconnected parts, and that means you got to compromise to fit them together. Yes, this design bugs me, but I know if I worked on that game, I would be saying, yeah. But if we made it work the way you like, it would break this other thing everybody loves. I am sure our game will be the same. We think you will like it. But I'm sure we will all find stuff in it we think is annoying. It just won't all be the same stuff. I think our track record on testing speaks for itself. We just released the revised Illrigger because we thought there was a better version of that class out there. No one paid us to do this. We just thought it was a good idea. I think our work speaks for itself. Okay, I talked about the game. I pitched you on the core rules and classes. We talked about how this crowdfunder works, the different pledge levels and stretch goals. We talked about how playtesting works. We talked about the risks, about how we think you're going to get a backer packet in the middle of next year, but we don't know. We talked about our goals for an open license. We talked about shipping. I think that's most of what you need to know, so I want to spend a couple minutes here at the end talking about this company, about MCDM. I don't know how to say this other than we treat everyone who works with us with respect. That means we pay well. We have the highest freelance rates in the industry because we think if you do enough work for us, you should be able to afford, like, rent and food. <laughs> Crazy, right? We pay everyone on time when we approve the final work, not 30 days after the book ships. No, when we approve the final draft, you get paid. 
We give people time. We pay them for revisions. If we see a job is a lot of design and not a lot of writing, well, sometimes we pay more because word count isn't always the best way to value writing. I don't know why other companies don't do this. I mean, some literally can't afford it, but some can. If we fail, I mean, I, I, I won't be surprised, but we will have failed on our terms. Okay, that's about it. Yeah, tons of questions. We want to answer them. So look forward to a frequently asked questions video or a live stream. And honestly, I think if you like what you heard in this video, you will like this game. If you've played the Beast Heart, the Talent, the Illrigger, Flea Mortals, you know our design. It's not about reinventing the wheel and making a game that uses, like, I don't know, like magic eight balls to resolve combat. It's about making the thing you're already doing more fun and we think easier. We'll do a live Q&A here tomorrow, probably. We'll do a FAQ video probably next week. Come by the Discord if you got questions you need answered now. There are tons of people in the Discord who are already super well educated on the game and would love to answer your questions. Email hello at mcdmproductions.com if you have a problem. I believe in this team. I'm incredibly lucky to work with them. I believe in this product. We may run a session this month, record it and share it. I, I don't know. It is really hard for me to see past this announcement video because we have just all worked flat out on this for the last three months. We are wiped out. We need a break. But I believe in what we're doing. And I believe in this community and this hobby. It's the most fun you can have with your brain, folks. We just want to make it easier and more fun. We want to give you something new to look forward to. I am not a cynic. I think cynicism is the death of wisdom. I am an optimist. When I went to Gen Con in the 90s, there were just a ton of cool new RPGs, tons of players, lots of different cool fantasies. I think it's time we had that again. I think the future can be better than the past, and we want to give more people an excuse to get back to the table and play. That's it, folks. Video's got to end sometime. Might as well be here. Until next time, peace out. Your mom's got a built-in tool.